here at the highest geological point in the cave. We're at the junction between the overlying Penderinoolite and the Douglas limestone beneath, and this is the honeycomb sandstone again. It differs very slightly to what we saw on the surface. There's a, a well-marked shale band, or now converted to clay. This is one of the few examples where the cave passages extend upwards into the Pendering Oolite. And this is simply because there's a fault which directs the flow of water and probably does produces a certain amount of mineralization along the fault plane. Essentially calcite, calcium carbonate. The frequency of joints increases close to the faults and this explains why there has been collapse upwards into the Pendiri oolite here. We are now looking at a very flat roof caused by a very competent bed of the Pendiri oolite up to which passages or chambers tend to migrate by collapse into the voids caused by the uh, dissolution of the Dolis limestone. We are now in the big chamber near the entrance. This is characterized by a domed arched roof which extends upwards into and through some rather massive limestone beds. Coming down from our previous chamber, we passed through some well bedded limestones and then massive limestones, seven and three meters thick and these occur up in the roof here. If we look at the drainage patterns in the surface streams in this area, we find that there are nick points and rejuvenation features in many of the rivers. It is possible to identify heights at which the rate of erosion increased perceptibly. These are, can be followed down towards the sea. These relate to levels within the cave. So we are able to identify these strings of large chambers at the same height as the um, features that we've just talked about in the streams outside. These are characterized by uh, frequent horizontal dissolution grooves in the cave walls. And this implies a fairly constant level in the uh, water table. These can be followed down towards the sea, um, stepping wise uh, and uh, following the um, the longitudinal profile of the proto Taue River, or the very early Taue River, and these relate to um, a coastal erosion platform at about 200 meters above sea level. The age of these are difficult to be more precise about, but we're talking maybe of post Miocene, which would give um, a possible age extending from about 10 million years to maybe 2 or 3 million years ago. Where you get passages increasing in width and chambers increasing in size, they extend beyond the limits of the roofing material to support the the weight. Uh, where the beds are fairly thin, say up to a few meters or a meter or so, then they will collapse because the perpendicular joints to the bedding planes cause weaknesses and they collapse. A chamber or passage therefore migrates upwards until it either reaches a stable shape, which is a gothic arch or they come to a very thick bed where the 
frequency of vertical or perpendicular joints is reduced, and then that forms a flat roof or flattish roof. The ultimate flat roof, of course, is the Pendiri Nuhla. Where you have an updip wall on the passage which uh, is aligned along the strike of the beds, then you get a great deal of spalling of, of boulders from the up, or the hanging wall in this case. The foot wall or the, uh, the down dip wall is usually very stable. So it doesn't collapse to the same extent. So we can sometimes see the original passage wall oh, yes. on the down dip side, yes. whereas the up dip side is a collapsed structure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and clearly the joints on the up dip side expand more quickly because they've got space oh, to go into. Yes. So there's a sort of pressure release component yes. to yes, this as well. Right. Right. As if you're digging through a boulder choke, it's often better to go on the down dip side <laughs> rather than where you think might be safest than going the up dip side.